we come up with this extraordinary set of manoeuvres which justify our inaction, or even worse, the performative action that gives you the illusion of change, that just about ticks the change box, but leaves you actually pointing in exactly the same direction. So if you look out at what's coming ahead, smooth waters or choppy, we've clearly put a huge amount of, you know, stuff back in the box. Brexit, the energy crisis, COVID, but you could argue there's some choppy waters ahead. When I was doing the future proofing program, we got in the habit of looking at these weak signals of the future. Just throwing out a couple. If you look at the price of woolly mammoth tusks going up or down, answer, it's cratering. Why? Because warming is just melting the ice. And this is not about woolly mammoth tusks. This is about methane, 424 gigatons of methane just below Lake Baikal in Siberia alone. You've got clearly generative AI, a uh, technology that's accelerating at 180,000 times the speed of the human brain that's taken 360,000 years to double. You've got this convergence of megatrends, these collisions of technologies that are accelerating and converging. And there's no question that there's going to be some disruption. But there's a great quote from my favorite political thinker, Marilyn Monroe, who says, sometimes good things fall apart so that better things can fall into place. What's also clear is that we're at this extraordinary delta where there's not just a downside that's unprecedented, there's also the potential to take in the arsenal of technology we've got and to inflect it to address the huge amount of challenges we've got and to turn them into vast opportunities that raise the living standards, that create new growth markets, education, housing, across the batches of challenges we've got. And to my mind, unlock a wave of growth that could be way better, way more inclusive, way richer, way more, way more fun than what we got at the moment. So what are the key challenges? If you're a leader and you really want to drive change, I would throw out two, in fact. The first is being in an organization where it really is on the receiving end of a change. What's it felt like? Answer probably pretty bad. Organizations are really good at knowing how to resist and it's a vital skill. Otherwise you're going to be in a permanent state of, 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 of transformation. So you're going to encounter this state of institutional threat rigidity right when an organization needs to change. It's going to be a little bit frozen in the headlights and you're coming at it with this change plan. And the answer is they're going to look at you like you're rocking the lifeboat they're clinging to. And you're going to see, uh, all the threat rigidities that organizations come getting um, getting amplified. You're going to see centralization. You're going to see innovation budgets getting cut. You're going to see the uh, dissenting voices getting marginalized. You're going to see elbows getting really sharp and psychological safety dropping down. All the mechanisms that organizations in fact need to nurture the innovation suddenly become really fragile. But the second thing that you're going to encounter, and this is what we're researching with um, the Oxford project that I'm, I'm leading as um, with the with the Smith School at Oxford, you're going to see that there's individual stress responses that get really complex and where there'll be a bunch of members of your teams and your management and even you yourself, where you'll deal with the pressure of stress and stress of change and the dissonance it creates and the logic conflict between the demands of the boss, the demands of this climate initiative and the demands of your own job and keeping the show on the road, that your colleagues will be dealing with that conflict by coming up with what the psychologists call motivated cognition, which is essentially a set of kind of jujitsu moves that we all of us make in the brain to justify inaction. And if you think about this in very concrete terms, you'll see that if you take climate change or a tech transformation, you'll hear these voices out there who might be the skeptic who say, yeah, does it really work? It might be the techno solutionist on climate. I don't need to do anything because Elon Musk is going to sort it out. It might be the catastrophist who says, 
that change program's never going to work anyway, or climate change is so far gone, there's nothing we can do. So we come up with this extraordinary set of manoeuvres which justify our inaction, or even worse, the performative action that gives you the illusion of change, that just about ticks the change box, but leaves you actually pointing in exactly the same direction. So how do you define the really transformational leader? I mean, let me try giving you a really clunky metaphor. Let's say we're all in a big old bus, and that bus is kind of headed towards what looks possibly like, in the worst cases, a bit of a cliff face, maybe multiple cliff faces. And it might be inequality, it might be climate, you name it, it might be geopolitical issues. And I think you've got three options for leaders, and there's only one of them that's a real problem. Um, what's the first option? There's the leader gets behind the wheel of the bus, there's the cliff, and they announce to the passengers, folks, guess what? I got some good news for you. We're heading over the cliff. And I want to say to you, they're not a problem, just the lousy manager, because they're going to get sacked. The passengers on the bus are going to rise up and say, get out of that seat. Then you've got a second leader who gets behind the wheel and turns, manages to take us onto not the X or Y axis, but the Z axis and really delivers change. They're clearly not the problem. It's a third leader though, which is I suspect the leader we're all trained to be, which is the leader that gets behind that wheel and optimizes and realizes there's a real conflict because the sat nav has got over the cliff, plugged into the destination. And that's where the grooves are on the road. And that's where the wheels are naturally turning. And it's pretty damn hard and career risky to maneuver that change. So what that leader does is they actually keep their hands locked in the same direction on the wheel, but they indicate left. And they say, yeah, we'll be turning left by 2050. That's our plan. And they make some announcements over the tannoy of the bus saying, keep calm folks, it's gonna be fine, we're turning left. And that's the leader that I think is the real issue, the sustaining leader. And the transformative leader is the one who actually manages to identify the mega trends that drive the need for change, that informs themselves of that transformative intent, and then creates the collective agency and forms the mission-based team that manages as a group, as a collective team, because there is no transformative leader. There is only a transformative team to drive the change home. So how do you really make that happen as a change agent? For me, there's four steps. If you want to deliver change and survive, not completely burn out. And in each of these steps, there's a demon you got to slay. And the first step actually is to be still enough to notice the thing that really needs to be noticed, to notice the problem that's not from some drop down menu of shiny objects of the thing, things that you think are good things to do because you'll get bored of them and they won't resonate. It's to be still enough and to be present enough to notice the problem that really needs to be solved. So you've got to slay the demon of distraction and really develop the attention mindset. And if that happens, if there's this alignment between what you're noticing and, 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 and wanting and fits you and what the, what the world's asking for, then this idea, it's not that you will have the idea, the idea will have you, you'll be bitten. You'll be bitten by it and you'll be informed by it and, 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 and infused by it. There's then a second uh, radical shift of skill sets that you've got to develop because suddenly you're almost like a, a convert. You're like a a zealot with your idea. If you're really going to be able to do something that is driving change and you're, you're going to need that. But if you're going into an organization with your zealotry, with your dogmatism, right? This is what we got to do. And it may be on climate. It may be on a tech transformation. It may be on gender or maybe whatever it's on. If you're just going at it and you're going at it, the risk is that what you're going to create is polarization from those very people in the organization who are actually locked into business usual and who need it. So there's a moment where there's a crucial shift in your mindset that you're going to need to pull off, which is to sit back, to let go of the dogma and to start to listen and to be really humble and to go to the person probably who's your biggest obstacle, 
the one who's really making life tough and blocking the change you're trying to drive and just listen the bejesus out of them and why them because they're the ones who got the power they're the ones who've got the insight they're the ones who if they can unlock for you what the real barrier is that could get them on board they're the ones who you are going to be able to leverage and catalyze and work with that platform to deliver change so that old marcus aurelius saying the obstacle is the way go to that obstacle and just listen drop the dogma and really move into the listening mode and if you've done that then there's going to be a third step in the journey that's going to be just as crucial which is for you to lose a bit of your own ego because this is going to have been a process that's been about you and your vision and your ability to knock down these barriers but there is no transformative leader independent of that transformative team there's another moment where you've got to move into a build out not a diy mode where you've got to harness all the diversity all the dissonance and you've got to create that mission-based team by trying to unlock in them just that same passion and enthusiasm that you yourself have had for that project and all of them are going to have their own driver all of them are going to have their own thing that really motivates them and it's only if you can listen to them and unlock that that you're going to achieve that real mission-based team that's going to be way more powerful than you on its own and then there's a last phase if you can do that and suddenly you've got the power of this collective team that's really working towards this shared goal which is paradoxically to move into this state where it really doesn't feel like work anymore and actually it's almost like the warm winds going through your hair and it's a state that's close to joy like a team that is rowing in unison on the river it doesn't feel like effort because you are in the flow i think you've got to allow yourself a bit of that joy a bit of that bliss a bit of that chilling at the end of the race and experiencing the state that really is close to bliss when you pull something off together. And why do I say that? Because if you manage to do this thing collectively, there's this great study by Desi and Ryan who talk about the secrets of real contentment. And they say it's three things. It's a sense of agency. Yeah, you can do stuff. It's the sense of autonomy. You're not just delivering someone else's mandate, ticking their box. This is what you wanted to do. And then the last is connectedness. You did it together as a group. And as you realize the emotional satisfaction of what you've just pulled off it's a really important signal because it's not just that you've done something in the world it's not just you've done something in your organization and planted a seed with this collective team you've done something to yourself on your own wiring because i think we're all taught to live on the thin gruel of the corporate bonus and the paycheck and the progression up the hierarchy and little of that has got anything to do with that deep contentment and bliss but what you've given yourself is a reframing you've given you the corporate robot that we're all asked to be a taste of something very radically different and much more satisfying and i think you've then opened up the possibility that what you become is not just a one-off one-hit wonder but someone who serially goes out and tries to drive some change mm -hmm.